13 verses of Acts the second chapter this morning as we continue on our study on the church on fire. The first, the first uh, 13 uh, verses here. Verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not, these all, not, are, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites whose dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. I want to speak simply from this thought this morning, ground zero. Father, we're so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful for your mercy. We pray, Lord God, that you open our hearts and our minds to your perfect will, Lord God. That we will, Lord Jesus, embrace your truth. That we would, Lord God, pursue your way, God. That we, Lord Jesus, will grab a hold to the call that you've placed upon us as the church, as the body, as your people, Lord God. Lord, and we pray that the same power that, Lord Jesus, these believers experienced in that upper room would visit us this very day. And we We'll give you the glory and we'll give you the honor for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. As I begin to consider this message this morning and begin to consider a title for this message this morning, I wanted to find a title that was equal to the magnitude of what happened on that day in Jerusalem. Equal to the magnitude of the impact that took place, not only in Jerusalem, but for all of time, for all of eternity, for all of history, for the entirety of the body of Christ, the magnitude that took place. And the only word that I could, the phrase that I could actually come up with was the phrase ground zero. I want you to notice the definition of ground zero of this morning. Ground zero is the epicenter of a rapid, intense, or violent activity often marked by radical change. When we talk about ground zero, we talk about ground zero. We call ground zero the place where the nuclear bombs were dropped on Japan. And we mark that as ground zero. If you've ever been to New York City, to the site where 9-11 took place, that ground is called ground zero. It is a place where something happened that would forever change history. It was a place where something happened that would ever change the way we think about the world around about us. It was a place that happened that would forever change time to where we can mark it by before and after this great event took place. And as I looked at the, the events that took place at Pentecost, I realized that what happened there was truly a spiritual ground zero. It was truly Truly a place where God's work and God's power and God's might was magnified to the point that it forever changed history. It forever changed the church. It forever changed even eternity. All of history will pass away one day. We, we won't have to worry about being good at history because in eternity a lot of what went on in this earth we'll forget about. But there's going to be three major events that heaven will never forget. That's Calvary, that's the empty tomb, and that's the day of Pentecost. And I believe that as we look at this ground zero experience this morning, that we'll see the impact that it made upon our lives, upon our hearts. 
Now you may say, well, Derek, ground zero kind of has negative connotations. Oftentimes it's used in war times. Oftentimes it's used in, 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 in bad things that take taking place and bad events that has marked or scarred our life. And yes, Pentecost is a blessing for the church. Pentecost is a blessing for the kingdom of God. Pentecost is a blessing for our future and everything that we have for it. We're sitting here today because Pentecost happened oh, many, many years ago. But as I look at it, I realize it's not, it wasn't a blessing to everyone. As a matter of fact, for the kingdom of darkness, this was an act of war. This was 3,000 souls that was plucked from out of heaven's path, I mean hell's path, onto heaven's glory. This was, this was a, a magnitude that hit them and it took them by surprise. Hell is still reeling from Pentecost. They're still reeling from what took place on that glorious and wonderful event. Why? Because it was for them ground zero as well. It was ground zero for a culture that was filled with sin and filth and, and any form of debauchery because what it did is it recruited people to walk with God, to walk in his holy ways, to walk in his holy manners. Ground zero for them was a conf confrontation against the lives that they lived. It was truly ground zero. But I'm here this morning to, to, to sort of notice that I still believe that the church of Jesus Christ needs the power that was unleashed at Pentecost. It needs that kind of power if we're going to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in these end times. I believe it is a power that is still available. I believe it is a power that is still vital. I believe it is a power that is still crucial if we're going to do and be what God would have for us to be. Reminds me of, of, a, of a vacuum salesman that found himself on, on the rural side of Tennessee many years ago, back when door-to-door -door salesmen used to make, make a living. Anybody remember the door-to-door -door salesman? Yes, yes, I, 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 I do too. Every once in a while you'll find somebody knocking on your door and you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> those, days, those days are long past. But this door-to-door -door vacuum salesman came bouncing up on the steps, knocked on the door, and this disheveled mom opened the door wide and said, can I help you. He did a quick scan as a good salesman in doing. He noticed over in the corner that she had been sweeping and that there was a, there was a pack of, a pile of, of dust and dirt and hair and whatever else that was, that was in that place and he held up his vacuum cleaner. He said, ma'am, this is the top of the line oh, technology. This is the best thing uh, that's that being made today. She said, he said, I want to make you a wager this morning, ma'am. She, she said, what's that? He said, I want to make a wager that, I, that this vacuum cleaner can in less in one minute, clean up that mess over in the corner that you have over there or I will eat it. She looked at him. She said, you promise? He said, yes, I promise. She said, but you, well, you better get a spoon and a fork. We don't have electricity out these ways. <laughs> How often is the church we've played the same game? We have our programs, we have our talents, we have our gifts, we have our abilities, but without power, we cannot be effective. Without power, we cannot be everything that God would have for us to be. Without power, we cannot know the effectiveness of what Jesus has truly called us to be. We're like a vacuum cleaner salesman trying to sell something without power, without electricity, that is nothing more than a piece of junk without the power to operate it. Well, let me tell you, the church is not much better off without the power of the Holy Ghost moving through us and flowing through us and being by us. We need to revisit Pentecost. We need to revisit Ground Zero. We need to see what God can teach us here in the Word of God. So that leads us to today's power principle. I kind of like this power principle. I might do this again and again. It's a quote by a man by the name of Vance Havner. And this is what he said. He said, we are not going to move this world by criticism of it nor conformity to it, but by combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. What was Vance Havner saying? He said, we've far too long tried to criticize it and it hadn't worked. We've even went the route of trying to, to conform to it and trying to be relevant to it. But none of that works because God's method is still God's method. And God's method is a church that is on, on fire with the Holy Ghost, a church that is empowered by the Spirit of God 
God a church that is ignited. I like what he said, combustion within. They're ignited from within by the power of what God has for their lives. So we need to realize this morning that that power principle for us, we need to realize this morning the vast necessity that Pentecost has for us. So this morning I want us to look at three vital, I'm going to call them vital vantage points for us to look at Pentecost. If we're going to truly understand what it means to us and what it can mean through us, we need to understand these three vital things. You see, we need to understand that Pentecost is first of all an event. Then we need to realize that Pentecost is secondly an experience. And then thirdly, we need to realize Pentecost is the impact. We need to see those three levels of Pentecost if we're going to truly understand what Pentecost can mean to us. So first of all, I want you to notice that Pentecost is in fact an event. It is a, it is a point in history that changed everything around about it. It is a point in history that was significant, not just that it happened, but when it happened. It was an appointment that God made with his church that was significant in its timing. It was significant in when it happened and how it unfolded in their life. Notice what Luke said in verse, verse number one here. He said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, reading that straight out in, 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 in the English language sounds like basically he said when Pentecost had arrived. That's basically how we hear. But if you, it, the translators will tell you that that phrase can be translated even better to say when the day of Pentecost had been fulfilled. That carries a very different message to it. Luke was simply pointing to the fact that what had been pointed to in the Old Testament was about to be fulfilled in the New. That what was been pointing to in, in time, in bygones past, in, in the form of a feast, was about to unfold to everyone to see it, that Pentecost was an event and Pentecost was going to take place. Now, there's something that we need to realize if we're going to really grasp this. We need to realize that, that there is a uncanny connection between the feast of Israel and what Jesus did when he was here. Notice if you will. Michelle if you could put up I want you to notice that this happened. We don't hear a whole lot about this. Later we have hear about it in the, in the New Testament that these feasts un, when they unfolded was significant because at the exact same time Jesus fulfilled them. On the, on the, on the, on, during Passover Jesus died. As a matter of fact, when he was hanging on the cross, taking our sins away, the streets of Jerusalem was running red with the blood of thousands upon thousands of lambs that was being sacrificed for Passover. And Jesus was truly fulfilling what John the Baptist said he was when he pointed to him and he said, behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the earth. Was it coincidence Derek that on the day of Pentecost, I mean on the day of Passover that Jesus died for your sins? No. He was destined to die for our sins. Destined to die as our the Passover lamb. Paul goes as far as to say he is our Passover. Then secondly, three days later, there was a feast called the Feast of First Fruits, in which they recognized the first fruits of the barley harvest that, that was there. Does anybody know what happened three days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? He rose again. As a matter of fact, Paul once again jumps in and he points and he says this, that Jesus has become the first fruits of them that slept. Once again, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy and fulfilled the, the feast of, of first fruits by showing us that in the fulfilling of the first fruits, he was fulfilling the feast that was, that was looking on. Some people say, well, then why did Jesus wait so long uh, before pouring out the spirit of upon his people, I believe it was a very simple reason, is that, that there was a feast coming up. 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits is the Feast of Pentecost. It's the Feast of Pentecost that, that in which he would choose to pour his spirit out upon all flesh. That he would pour his spirit out upon us. That he would fulfill the prophecies of Old Testament days. Why is it significant, Derek? Because to the Jew, to the Israeli, during those days. Pentecost signified two things that it's important for us to realize because when we understand the significance of those two things, we'll see what it meant to fulfill the, the Feast of Pentecost. You see, the very first thing that it marked was it marked 
a new harvest. Pentecost was day 50. While the Feast of First Fruits marked the barley harvest, there was a much better harvest coming. That was the harvest of wheat that was coming. And on the, on the Feast of Pentecost was, the, was 50 days later when he began to show and he began to reveal to them that there was the, uh, of, a new, of a new harvest that was coming. You see, what, the, what they would come to realize was on that day, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus would start a brand new harvest. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus would save 3,000 people to add to the church and that harvest has still been going ever since. You see, when the church forgets that Pentecost is about the harvest, then we miss the very purpose of Pentecost. We miss the very reason of Pentecost. It is about the winning of souls. It is about the saving of, 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 of eternities for so many people. Pentecost is about a new harvest. I want to be a part of that new harvest that is still going on today. But it is also about a new covenant. If you do the math from when children of Israel left Egypt uh, and, and Passover took place and you added about 50 days or so to that, you'll realize that you'll find God's people at the foot of the Mount Sinai. Sinai where God had etched into stone the laws and his covenant with his people. It was a, it was a covenant of Moses and for so many years they had lived under the covenant and under the burden of a law that they really couldn't fulfill. But now there is coming a new covenant. Now there is coming a new way of life. Now there is coming a new agreement that the Father would have with his church and would have with his people by which the, that new that new Sinai was Pentecost. That new Sinai was, was, was what he was pouring out on his people. You see, uh, uh, during the, uh, when Moses was on the mountain, he witnessed God etch into the stone the Ten Commandments. But Jeremiah prophesied that there was coming a new covenant. Notice what it said in Jeremiah 31 and 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, you're a rule following people. No, the rules are on the inside of us. They're alive. They're living. You see, I got a new covenant where the laws of God are written in my heart and my mind. Where the power of God is revealed in me. It is a new covenant covenant that God has for us. So if we're going to understand oh, what Pentecost truly meant to the Hebrew people and what it meant in its fulfillment to the Hebrew people, we need to realize that on that day God marked a new harvest. And on that day God marked a new covenant for his people to unfold before them. But secondly, I want you to realize that not only is it, what is it, what is it, an, is it a, an event, Pentecost is an experience. Uh, th that we can have. You see, the early church had, had, none of the, had none of the trappings that we had today. The early church didn't have nice buildings. The early church didn't even have air conditioner. How could they have a revival without air conditioner? The early church didn't have uh, 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 established denominations. The early church didn't have an organ player. The early church didn't have a carpeted sanctuary. The early church didn't have any of these things, but they transformed the world. They changed their world around about them. How did they do that, Derek? Because of an experience that they had had. Because of an experience that they had with the Holy Ghost in their lives that changed them, that transformed them, that transformed their way and their walk and everything that they did. You see, we need to understand that experience if we're going to move further and further with God. See, the first thing I want you to notice that took place with the early, with, on the day of Pentecost was that they experienced, first of all, God moving among them. Notice what it said in verse 23, verses 2 and 3. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. Now something I want you to understand here is that what is being described here is not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
What is being described here is leading up to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's leading up to the infilling. What is happening here is not something that is happening inside of them, but it's something that is happening around them. And as they, begin to, as they begin to witness God move, as they begin to witness God transform hearts and lives, as they begin to witness God move among them, it became something that was so very powerful in their life. Notice how, how it happened. First of all, they said there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind. I've heard preachers talk about the wind blowing through there was no wind blowing through. It didn't ever say there was a wind blowing through uh, the upper room. There was a sound of a mighty wind. And it, and, it, and it sounded of such a magnitude that it said it filled the entire house. What do, you, what do you think that means, Derek? I believe it simply means that it sounded like it was coming from every direction. It sounded like it was coming from every angle. The wind of the Spirit. The whole, God was vi visiting His people. God was stepping down in that room. God was manifesting Himself to those people with a simple message. What I'm about to bring, you've heard about in the Old Testament as the wind. And what I've, I'm about to bring to you you've heard about in the Old Testament as the fire. I'm about to show you what it's all about. I'm about to reveal to you the, the experience that the church had been waiting for for so long. So he said there was a mighty wind and, and he said also that there were tongues. Uh, there, there, was, there were cloven tongues as of fire. I want, you, I want you to notice what he said here. Not fire, but like fire. I believe this was the Shekinah glory of God that was being revealed into them. This was a ball or a mass from what, from what we can understand of fire that came in their midst. And then something happened while it was there. The fire began to divide. It began to split. And the fire moved to every one of them that was in that room. Every, every head had a flame of like a, as a fire above them. I believe that God was saying something. What I'm about to give to you, what I'm about to put in you, is going to not just be for the whole of you. It's going to be for every individual. It's for every one of you that has sought me. It's for every one of you that are open to me. It's for every one of you that will allow me to move on you and through you. God said, I've got a gift for you. Tim Enlow said this, this was not a single flame for all to share, but God's designed personal embrace from heaven for each one of them. See, he wanted them to understand that the anointing that was upon them would be equally powerful to each and every one of them. That it wasn't just for the special spiritually elite. It wasn't just for the pastors. It wasn't just for the teachers. But for as many as would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God was going to give it to them. So they first of all experienced a, the, 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 a move of God among them. But I'm so thankful for this next one because the next step in their, in their life was so very significant. And that is they experienced God moving in them. Not just among them. Now they were about to experience what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is when God begins to fill us. When God begins to overflow in us. Where God begins to, to magnify, be magnified within us. Notice what it said in verse number uh, four. Notice what it said in verse number four. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I want you to understand one area that I believe it causes quite a bit of confusion is some people believe that since there was that since we don't see wind and that we don't see a, 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 tongue, a tongue above our heads that the baptism is still not for us. That wasn't the baptism. That was God moving. And you don't see God stopping moving in all kinds of ways throughout the book of, of, of Acts. He works in multitudes of ways throughout the book of Acts. But when the infilling takes place, wherever you trace it through the, the, the book of Acts, you'll notice something. You'll realize a consistent Consistency there as to what happened in their life. You'll realize the consistency there of how the Holy Spirit began to speak, of how the Holy Spirit began to reveal Himself and manifest Himself. It said that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That word filled there is a very common word that we use that is very akin to the word we use, baptism, which means to saturate, which means to bring to the full, bring to the brink. It means to take all of. The Holy Spirit would fill them all. Now, now there's something I want you to understand here. I want you to understand that we are not being filled with anything less than God himself. 
I hear some Pentecostals talk as if the spirit is some kind of, uh, you know, magic thing that, that happened in their life. I got the spirit. No, if, if you got the Holy Spirit, the spirit actually has you because it's God living and moving and then operating in you. You see, God, the Holy Spirit is not just a thing. It's not just a spirit. It's not just a feeling that you have. The Holy Spirit is God himself. And what God is saying to these people today, I want to fill you to the brim with me. I want to fill you to the brim with everything that I am. I want to fill you to the brim where you're functioning and operating and moving by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are called on to be filled with His Spirit. But then something happened. The Bible says that they began to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to, they began Notice that word. They began to speak with other tongues. In other words, there is a continuation of this tongue talking that goes throughout the entirety of the book of Acts. It goes throughout the entirety of most of church history, by the way. It goes throughout the entirety of, of, of things. It is a beginning that will continue again and again and again. There is at least six instances in the, in the book of Acts that you can point to that where the Spirit moved, there was tongues that, that was involved. Three of them flat out says it. We see it in, 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 when, when, when Peter goes and preaches in the house of Cornelius and it says and the, and, the, and the Spirit fell upon them in the house of Cornelius and they said that we knew the Spirit fell upon them because they all spake with other tongues. We, we, we know that when, when, the, when the apostles went to Ephesus and they found a group of believers that had already given their life to Jesus Christ, they had one question for them. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And then they laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In other instances... It is not as clearly sp spoken out. But in other instances, we see the, 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 the inference, the, the, the manifestations that was in every one of the manifestations that was taking place here was repeated again and again and again. What are you talking about, Derek? I'm talking about an infilling of the Holy Spirit with signs of speaking with other tongues. Now, you can't leave this place this morning saying, well, we don't have a Pentecostal pastor. <laughs> you see signs with speaking in tongues I don't believe there's any greater evidence in, 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 the, in the word of God than that evidence that, that, we see, that we see here you see but we need to understand something and I, as I said earlier uh, as Pentecostals sometimes we get stuck in the rut where we begin to seek tongues and that's not what we should seek we should be seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We should be seeking the Holy Spirit moving among us and blessing us. Further evidence that God wanted this to be something that would continue in our lives is the writings of Paul. You can't read Corinthians without, without running into him giving instructions about tongues and how tongues should operate in our lives. How tongues should be a part of even our prayer life, he says. He begins to unfold this. He begins to unpack this. As he begins to reveal to us that as, as, as spirit-filled people, we should be open to the spirit moving through us and the spirit moving among us. You see, I want you to understand that, that this was, they begin to speak with, notice what it said, other tongues. In other words, these tongue, tongues, as we would see in just a few minutes, were languages that was across, across the world. And somebody pointed out, well, that's not new tongues. That, well, Paul talked about new tongues. Well, that's not the tongues of men and angels. Well, Paul talked of the tongues of, of angels as well. Paul begins to unpack for us in, the, in, in Corinthians uh, what these things mean for us. So he said there is an experience that we can have as believers. There is an experience that we can have that is, that is, that is, that is, that is in addition to salvation. Yes. It, see, see, the gift of salvation is there to cleanse us, to save us, to redeem us, to deliver us from sin to set us apart from the world but the gift of the spirit as we'll see here in the word of God is to empower us to be witnesses is to empower us to reach our world is to empower us to re it's not just there to bless you it's not just there to make you feel good about yourself it's not just there to minister to you but it's there to minister through you which leads us to the very the, the, the very last thing that we see in their experience is there is that they had an experience of God moving through them. That was the point. The point wasn't the tongues. The point wasn't even the infilling. 
The point was, this is important enough. Jesus said, this is important. He said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem, not so that you can get a better education. He said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem, not so that you can have more faith. He said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem, not so that you can uh, ha- have, have better confidence uh, in your life. I want you to wait in Jerusalem because I'm sending the power. And because I'm sending the power, you're going to see it working in your life. Because I'm sending the power, it's not only going to work in you, but it's going to work through you. Notice what it said in verse 6. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. God was using them that day to minister to everyone around them. God was using them that day to bring in the harvest. Was this all that was said? No, this wasn't all that was said. I heard one person say the reason they had to speak in tongues because people didn't understand them. I said, well, that's the problem with that. And they're like, what? said, Peter spoke in Hebrew. And won 3,000 people to the Lord. These, these, according to the Bible, these were Jewish people that were multi-language. They, they had, they were, they, but they understood the languages that, that were being heard. They were in Jerusalem to walk in among the people. You see, God's will was that God would use them. Wow. So, so what, where does that bring us, Derek? That brings us to the very last point that I want you to notice this morning. And that point is this. The p- impact of Pentecost. I believe we do ourselves a great disservice if we overlook how Pentecost impacted the world in which they were living in. How Pentecost impacted what was going on in their lives. Oh, and what an impact it really was. Because in the, the very first thing we've already seen it is that before God will impact our world, He must impact us. Before God will transform our, our cities, He must transform us. Before God must, can, be, can, can, can minister and move through Freeport, He's got to have a people that's willing to be moved upon first. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit moved upon them, and because the power of the Holy Spirit moved upon them, God moved through them. But let me tell you, let me warn you, there's a cost to this Pentecostal experience. There's a cost. It'll cost you your mundane, comfortable life. When Once you get into God's plan, there's nothing boring about it. There's nothing humdrum about it. But once you get into God's plan, hallelujah, things begin to happen. It may cost you your reputation. As Pentecostals, we're used to being, hmm, those people. On the wrong side of the the tracks. Those people that believe that what God did then, God can still and still does now in, in our midst. We, it may cost us our reputation. But notice, the, the, one of the great things is that it will impact the lost. I believe as we begin to move and function in the power of the Holy Spirit, that God will begin to shine brightly through us. I believe it will, He will shine brightly in our life. Notice what it said uh, in verse number, I believe it's number, uh, what is it, Michelle? Number six, verse six, there you go. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Verse 8. I mean, verse 7. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Then verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? What happened to the crowd that day? There were some things, some indicators that shows us maybe what we should expect when we begin to see God move around us and to move through us. There are some stirrings that that goes on among those that are unbelievers. There are some stirrings that take place. Notice some of the words they used. He said they were were confused. They were amazed. They were perplexed. Uh, They began to question. They began to say, what is going on? They become, all of a sudden there was a stirring that was taking place in their lives. The first stirring I see is there was an attractive stirring. It said they came together. They began to draw together. They didn't know what they were, they were like 
off to the flames. They didn't know what they were, that was attracting them to that place or to those people. They had confusion. They had curiosity. But as they moved toward God, let me tell you, when we let God move among us, we're going to see some people we never expected to see come through those doors. We're going to see some people that we never dreamed of would give their heart to Jesus Christ. Why? Because I believe in the power, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you got saved when you went to a church service not expecting to get anything out of it? <laughs> How many of you just joined the church thinking that, oh, I'll never be a part of that. I'll never be a part. You know, what happens is when we begin to get near it, when we begin to get near the flame, all of a sudden the convicting power of the Holy Spirit takes a hold of our life. And it may leave us confused. It may leave us amazed. It may leave us asking a lot of questions. But it'll leave us of one thing. It'll leave us hungry. It'll leave us thirsty for what God has in our lives. One of the greatest evangelists that has ever walked this planet was a man by the name of John Wesley. Anybody familiar with the Methodist church? Uh, he was the beginning of Methodism. And he, he, he saw multitudes come to the Lord. He saw people. He, he traveled across this country on horseback. He, he, he traveled acro across England. And, 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 he, and he said this. And I love this quote by John Wesley. He said, get on fire for God and men will come and see you burn. <laughs> if we will allow the Holy Spirit to set us aflame, people will wonder what we got. People will be confused. But then there'll be those. Let me tell you, it'll, it'll, it'll impact the kingdom of darkness as well. Because the Bible says that there were those in the crowds that were mocking them. That there were those, that, who were they stirred up by? The kingdom of darkness. I believe the devil was out there saying, oh, we got to stop this. We got to slow this down. And one of the biggest plots of the devil is mockery. One of the biggest plots of the de devil is to, is, is, is to point a finger of an accusation to somebody. And they wanted to mock it away. But let me tell you, the mocked wasn't strong enough to stand against the power of the Holy Spirit. The mocked wasn't strong enough to stand against what God had for them. You see, God has for us, church. Church, a power that is still relevant today. God has for us, church, an anointing that is still what he desires for our lives today. He wants us to know that, yes, it was an event. But more importantly, it's an experience that you as the body of Christ can experience in the here and the now that will empower you to be ready to change and to transform your world. Now next week we're going to be looking at Simon Peter as he answers that question, what is this? <laughs> as he answers the question, what's going on? Why is all this happening? And he will unfold to us the very first gospel message uh, that the church has ever, ever heard. And, and I believe we're going to be surprised as we see that the gospel is not always what we think it is. The gospel is not always what, how we've cu cubbyholed it. That for the early church, it had a significant role and a significant place to play in our life. But church, we as believers, we have a place to play. There was a lady by the name of Hedy Green. Hedy Green, was, Hedy Green was once marked as the richest woman that ever lived. She, when she passed away, she died in 1916 and her estate was wor worth over $100 million dollars. In 1916, that was that's probably equate to billions now. She was one of the the wealthiest women uh, to, to ever live. But Hetty was not known for her wealth. She was known for her cheapness. She was one cheap lady. Here was a woman that would eat cold oatmeal because she didn't want to pay for the fire that it would take uh, to, to heat up uh, the water to, 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 have, to have oatmeal. She was a woman that she didn't seek medical attention. She waited until she could find a free clinic and then she got whatever she could get from that free clinic. She waited so long with an injury to one of her son's legs that they had to amputate his leg because she, would re she refused to pay for the medical attention that, that she had. She would uh, ultimately and eventually die from a disease that was easily curable had she Got up, put, stop pulling on the personal dreams and stop squeezing that nickel. She died and she left behind her a hundred million people. She, I mean, a hundred million dollars. She left behind a hundred million dollars that she could have lived her life with. She could have saved her life with. She lived like a pauper and she was filthy rich. Church, 
you're filthy rich. You've been given the power of God in your life. You've been given the gift of the Father, as Simon Peter would put it. You are a wealthy church, but you've got to live like it. <laughs> you've got to embrace it. You've got to say yes to it. What was the biggest difference? You see, back in, back in old, olden times in the early 1900s, uh, when, when Pentecostalism was really beginning to flourish and begin to take place in, in the United States, they had seeking meetings because they'd take, they'd take the book of Acts and they believed that it was, and they believed that to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you had to seek it just like the early apostles did. But you know, let me tell you, one thing they overlooked, the Spirit had already come. The Spirit was already there. And the Spirit didn't need you spending 10 and 20 hours just seeking Him to, to fill you. It was a promise that as Simon Peter declared that is unto you and to your children and as many as the Lord your God shall call. We, all we have to do is say yes to receiving Him. All we have to do is say yes to that gift in your life. Would you stand with us this morning? Oh, thank you for giving me the liberty this morning. Spend a little bit more time <laughs> declaring the goodness of God. I believe this is still the key that will save our world. Let me say this, and I, I don't mean to offend anybody, but politics won't save our world. Just having the right singers on stage won't save our world. Just having talented speakers won't save our world. The same thing it took in Acts 2, it will take today in our churches. And that is a mighty move of God in us and through us. Where a church wakes up and realizes I'm rich in the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. We're going to see in just a few weeks where Peter steps to the gate called Beautiful and a man is crippled there and he looks at him and says, Silver and gold, have I none? Oh, I tell you, the prosperity preachers don't want to hear that. He said, Silver and gold, have I none? But such as I have. What did he have? He had the Holy Spirit. Arise in Jesus' name and walk. Oh, I feel his presence in this house this morning. I feel his grace in this place this morning. If you're here this morning, you, you'd say, Derek, I, I, uh, you know, uh, I, I've, I've never received that gift. I would like to receive the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I would like to say yes and, and, and feel his power in me and to feel his power working through me. I would like to say yes this morning to, the, to that gift. If you would like to, to, for us to lay hands on you and to pray for you, that the Lord may fill you this morning, would you step out right now? Would you step out right now? I, I believe that that promise is still unto you. It's still for you. It's still wanting to work, work through you. Oh, sweet spirit of God. Oh, sweet spirit of God. Sweet spirit of God. Now I want you to join me this morning as your pastor. I want you to join me this morning. I want you, I want you, to, I want you to pray with me this morning uh, a very special prayer. I want you to pray with, you, with me this morning that the Lord will anoint us to live a life full of his spirit. That the Lord will manifest himself more in us now than he ever has before. That we would know the power, we would know the anointing, we would know the grace, we would know the enabling that he has for our lives. I want New Testament power. Amen? I don't want what just somebody else had. I want what they had. I want what the Holy Spirit is coming to give us. So let's pray this morning. Father, we look to you, Lord God. We dare believe that your promise is unto us and our children, and our children's children, and as many as the Lord God shall call. We pray, Lord God, this morning that you fill us afresh and anew, Lord God. We pray as this, this morning, Lord Jesus, that you'll anoint us, Lord, as we reach for our cities, God, as we reach for our neighbors. Lord Jesus, that our children can see a difference, Lord Jesus, that our neighbors can see a difference, Lord God, as you manifest yourself in us. 
that you manifest yourself through us, Lord God. You came to give it, and this morning we come to receive it, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we ask that, Lord, if we haven't moved in the way that you would have for us to move, that you anoint us, Lord God. Lord, we make room for you, Lord Jesus, today in our week, in our lives, in our ways, Lord God. Breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Bring life to us, Holy Spirit. Lord, let there be an anointing, Lord God, that our grandchildren will talk about. Let there be an anointing, Lord Jesus, that our neighbors can't stand to even be around because they feel the, 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 the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, God. Help us, Lord Jesus, this morning, God. Oh, Lord God, as we embrace the truth, as we embrace the life, as we embrace what you have for us, Lord God. God, set our face upon the harvest, God. Set our hearts upon the lost, God. Set our minds upon what you will intend to accomplish in us and through us, God. In these last days, may be, we be equipped with everything that you have for us, God. May we be equipped in every measure, in every way, in every magnitude, Lord God. Do it again in us, Lord Jesus. Do it again through us, Lord Jesus. Be with us, Lord God. In Jesus' glorious and wonderful name. And the church of Jesus Christ said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're so glad you've been here. Be back with us next Sunday for more of the book of Acts.